you all for coming. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you to Dr. Jordan for hosting me and to the Department of German and Russian at BYU. Um, and thank you also to the North American Dostoevsky Society. Um, we do have some members of the society who are on Zoom today, um, and I appreciate that we were able to have this talk co-sponsored by the society. So without further ado, I will get into it. Um, Brahmic realism is a term that was first used by literary scholar Mikhail Bakhtin in his dissertation, um, Francois Rabelais and the History of Realism, although it does not appear in any of his published works. At his 1946 dissertation defense, the examining committee attacked the concept and forced Bakhtin to remove all mention of Gothic realism to Bass. The committee objected to Gothic realism because, in their view, it was diametrically opposed to what they called classical realism, and you notice the heavy air quotes on that. One of the committee members simply called realism, quote, the antipode of the Gothic method during the defense, stating, according to your conception, there is one kind of realism, Gothic realism, and another, classical realism, and your preference is for the Gothic. I am completely unable to agree with Comrade Bakhtin. I am a supporter of classical realism. The committee's inflexibility on what is realist, again in air quotes, and what is outside its bounds is a testimony to the historical context of the defense. Stalinist Moscow was a dangerous time and place to assert non-conforming views. Bakhtin removed the term and was able to pass. At the defense, however, he affirmed this. I believe that I have added a new page to the history of realism. I have enriched the history of realism. The whole of the Gothic is the history of realism. In this exchange, classical realism refers to a literary and artistic tradition that developed across Europe from the 1830s and 40s. Realism, in this sense, has two overlapping meanings. On the one hand, it demarcates a chronological span of writing that corresponds to a new concern, an interest in depicting the result of contemporaneous social, political, and economic change. On the other, the term refers to an aesthetic style influentially defined by Roman Jakobsen as one that aims at conveying reality as closely as possible and strives for maximum verisimilitude while still achieving universalism, a universality that Ian Watt characterizes as a full and authentic report of human experiences. Peter Brooks observes that realism both appealed to and represented the private lives of the unexceptional, or rather found and dramatized the exceptional within the ordinary, creating a heroism of everyday life. This critical emphasis on realism's relationship to and championship of the everyday has led to a fundamental critical misunderstanding. Rene Wellick, for example, argues that realism, quote, rejects the fantastic, the fairy tale like the allegorical and the symbolic. For Wellick, realism implies also a rejection of the improbable, of pure chance, of extraordinary events, since reality is obviously conceived as the orderly world of 19th century science, a world of cause and effect, a world without miracle, without transcendence. In contrast to these critics, Bakhtin's insistence that, quote, the whole of the Gothic is a history of realism, end quote, seems placed outside the bounds of critical definitions of literary realism. Indeed, as I argue in my book, um, Gothic realism speaks to an intrinsic characteristic of realism that has been glossed over in other critical definitions, namely that reality is subjective, and realism is characterized by flexibility and openness to accommodate this subjectivity in its representation. So today in my talk, I'm going to discuss an early example of the Gothic genre's appearance within literary realism, specifically writing about Petersburg in the 1840s. In Russia, the 1840s witnessed the birth of the so-called natural school. This literary movement, championed by critic Vissarion Belinsky, was dedicated to a new literature that, inspired by Nikolai Gogol's novel Dead Souls, dealt, quote, with life and reality in their true light, end quote. To achieve the same, however, writers turned to earlier literary models, drawing on genres such as the physiological sketch and the Gothic novel. And I should say here that all of the quotes that I'm giving you are in, have been translated into English um, by me or by other translators. I have not put the translators' names on the slides, for which I apologize, but I will call out translators as I um, read their quotes. So this one I translated, um, and moving on, other translators have also uh, unknowingly contributed to this talk. 
So focusing on 1840s depictions of St. Petersburg in Nikolai Nekrasov's edited volume, The Physiology of Petersburg, Physiologia Petersburga, and Fyodor Dostoevsky's early prose from 1846 to 1849, this talk will look at how early Russian realists used and repurposed earlier styles, especially the Gothic, to develop new modes of urban representation. This rise of realism in Russia coincided with the rise of early commercial photography, following Louis Daguerre's announcement of the daguerreotype process in early 1839. The process was introduced in the Russian Academy of Sciences in the summer of that year, and in October 1839, the first successful daguerreotype in Russia was reported in the journal Son of the Fatherland, with the note that, quote, even at 60 degrees latitude in the autumn, the daguerreotype does not lose its effect, end quote. Daguerreotype studios became commonplace on the streets of St. Petersburg. This new technology, which placed emphasis on representing life with accuracy, was associated with vision, quote, with the lens imitating the retina to reproduce, to reproduce the world, end quote. The image on this slide is a 1850s photographic image of Petersburg. Um, and I want you to look closely at it. Notice the way that it depicts the street scene. Here's another from 1858. Um, which you can't really see in the auditorium because of the lights. Yeah, the dimming of the lights is not really working. But um, what I want you to notice is that the perspective in these two images is from the street. There's an attempt to depict not just the city. So you see sort of the larger buildings, like here, the St. Isaac's Cathedral, here, the Admiralty, right? Um, but those aren't the focus of the images. Um, and hopefully in the audience, you can, in the auditorium, you can kind of see the large spires sticking up. Um, what you do see is the commercial kind of grimy parts of the city, these small groups of stalls along the street. The street kind of takes center stage. And here in this image in particular, you have merchants um, selling their wares. There's a definite lack in these images of idealization. Grand buildings are not the focus here. Inspired in part by these technological advances, literary works of the 1840s represent the efforts of writers to work out new literary approaches for representing these aspects of life with verisimilitude. One trend during this period was the physiological sketch. In this genre, there was an attempt to mimic with writing the effect of the quote unquote objective camera with its presumption of truthful depiction. Literary realism relies on artful devices in order to render reality, again in quotes, in a way that believably resonates with readers' own lives. Indeed, realist works are frequently as much about the process of working out how to depict subjective reality as about depicting it. The openness of this self-conscious engagement with form enables literary realism to accommodate the Gothic. But which functions of the genre specifically appeal to realists? Um, and here I'm going to talk a little bit about the Gothic, which I know often in my audiences, people are not that familiar with. So uh, the Gothic, for those of you who don't know, is a late 18th century mode of writing that dwells on the macabre, the terrifying, and the gloomy. So this is, oh, yes. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is an example of a Gothic novel. Um, this was popular literature. Um, it was published rapidly. It was largely considered for its entertainment value. And often um, literary critics considered this to be somewhat lowbrow. Um, this was the kind of thing that people didn't necessarily admit to reading in public um, because they were it's sort of like um, the kind of like airplane detective novel that you would buy today. Uh, these are, these are um, the popular literature of the time. As in for, um, so, so this is one example. This um, frontispiece from a, a Gothic novel that was published in Russia in 1811. And this is from a, this is a translation from a French novel by Marcand. Um, the title for those of you who do not speak Russian is Night Visions or the Adventures of Unhappy Amanda and the Barbarism of Her Husband. So you get the sensationalism kind of in the title as well. Um, also in things like this, this is an excerpt from a story by Ukrainian writer Aras Solnov, and it describes the experience of a reader who is addicted to Gothic novels. Um, you can see that this is very far from a realist depiction of life, right? Um, she's breathing the atmosphere of the dungeon fed on the smell of murder. She lived on terror. Um, as a result of these kind of elements, and I should say that this one is parodic. So this is a, uh, a parodic take on the Gothic novel. 
Um, as a result of all of this, when we think of Gothic, we do not immediately think of its psychological impulses or its fascination with transgression. Our first associations are its conventions, ruined castles, um, incestuous abductions, mysterious strangers, and shrouded secrets. And indeed, Gothic novels became known for their ubiquitous collection of props, settings, and conventions that literary critics frequently lampooned, as here or in this um, in this recipe for a Gothic novel that appeared in a 1798 journal. These lines are intended humorously, but the ruined castle, skeletons, murdered bodies, and secret doors point to underlying anxieties bound up with historical practices, degeneration, birthrights, social and political oppression, marginalization, and transgression. Scholars have defined the Gothic in terms of its engagement with these practices. As Chris Baldick notes, Gothic fiction's, quote, distinctive animating principle is a psychological interest in states of trepidation, dread, panic, revulsion, claustrophobia, and paranoia, end quote. Gothic writers contrive to depict these states through the genre's conventions, transgressive behaviors, moments of unexpected and horrific discovery, and an atmosphere that anticipates violence at any moment. And here, um, the image is taken from Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho from the fifth edition of it, which came out in the late 18th century. Um, and these are, this is the discovery of a corpse, the sudden discovery of a corpse, which was uh, meant to evoke reader's terror. Um, we have a lot of records of famous people and not so famous people reacting to uh, Gothic novels. One famous one is in Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey, where the heroine uh, becomes very caught up with reading Gothic novels. A uh, perhaps less famous one is Dostoevsky, um, who his parents chose to read Gothic novels to him when he was a small child. And he recalls these early sleepless experience with the Gothic in a later um, writing from 1863. I used to spend the long winter hours before bed listening, for I could not yet read, agape with ecstasy and terror, as my parents read aloud to me from the novels of Anne Radcliffe. And then I would rave deliriously about them in my sleep. And again, Anne Radcliffe, um, this discovery of a corpse is one of them. So you get an idea of what those novels were like. So getting back to the physiological sketch, which I mentioned earlier, the physiological sketch's prevalence as a useful canvas for 1840s realist depictions is not surprising. But the Gothic's role seems peculiar, as its basic conventions appear diametrically opposed to realist aims. The physiological sketch, which describes what its narrator sees as precisely as possible, appealed to realists as an attempt to reproduce everyday life experiences in prose. Physiological sketches held great promise for the new realist aesthetic, but lacked a strong narrative force, relying more on exposition than plot. In contrast, Gothic writing was typically heavily plotted and included manifold narrative twists and turns to kind of surprise the reader and keep the reader reading. So then, <laughs> this begs the question, what is Gothic realism? Gothic realism, and this is my definition, um, refers to moments when authors writing in what we recognize as a realist style turn to Gothic narrative devices, using the genre as a tool to articulate a facet of lived experience by affectively engage engaging readers. The Gothic adds a layer to realist depiction that enables better representation of the subject. Its associations and themes, as well as its focus on narrative force, proved ideal for communicating the per perceived tragedy and horror and the emotional qualities bound up with those um, of the social problems associated with urban poverty to the readers of early realist works. Um, the Gothic is typically linked to a landscape characterized by crumbling castles, gloomy forests, and oppressive mountains, and takes its descriptive cues from the anxieties and fears of the protagonists as they feel kind of entrapped in these landscapes. While in Gothic novels, quote, the city, a gloomy forest, or dark labyrinth become a site of nocturnal corruption and violence, a locus of real horror, end quote, these same locales were also used in early realist fiction as reflectors of the corruption, violence, and squalor already present in society, particularly in the Petersburg slums. The Russian reader of the 1840s, already attuned to cues from the Gothic fiction read popularly for nearly 50 years by that point, was well able to recognize Gothic generic markers planted in non-Gothic texts. While sometimes used parodically or to give text an emotional humorous tone, these markers simultaneously evoked the trappings of the genre, secrets, violence, and transgressions, and suggested an underlying sense of mystery. In addition, the feelings of panic, fear, dread, and horror the Gothic aroused were useful in lending a charged atmosphere to settings most likely unfamiliar to the largely upper class or upper middle class reader, like dark alleys, decaying tenement buildings, etc. 
In establishing a pervading sense of anxiety and unease in their text through Gothic markers and themes, writers were able to direct readers to a better understanding of the injustices and issues they sought to highlight. As authors took on the mammoth project of depicting St. Petersburg life, they turned to the Gothic to help convey a sense of the city's unique atmosphere. Such moments, quote, offer one way of recognizing the unresolved tensions that persist in these works and qualify the effect of multiple perspectives converging on a shared social reality. Petersburg, um, and this is one of my own photos of Peter, you can't see it because it's too gloomy, dramatic. Um, but for those of you in the audience, it's kind of a canal with some mist on it. Um, it's one of my own photographs of Petersburg. Petersburg is a city that's particularly suited to the Gothic mode. Correlations with the Gothic exist between the natural features of the environment, such as swamps, poor weather, and gloomy light. However, the discrepancy between the city's regions also evokes the genre, an imported neoclassical fantasy set among artificial waterways. Petersburg houses both the opulently wealthy and also dimly lit tenements where residents live in squalor and destitution. Even the city's longstanding association in literature with empire, from Peter the Great's initial autocratic command to build it, to the bureaucratic table of, table of ranks that defines its social interactions, evokes the genre's preoccupation with authority and its themes of entrapment and anxiety. Perhaps the best example of this theme in the Russian literary imagination is Pushkin's poem, The Bronze Horseman, published 1835, which culminates with a monument to Peter the Great coming to life and chasing a hapless clerk through the capital's flooded streets. Indeed, the appearance of the Gothic in 1840s depictions of St. Petersburg seems an intuitive method for writers to represent a psychologically and sociologically charged urban Russian landscape. Other depictions of urban life from this time showed Gothic influence, although not on the same scale. Led by Belinsky, who considered French physiological works to be at literature's forefront of this new kind of so social emphasis on um, critique in literature, Russians became enamored with Eugène Sue's Mysteries of Paris, which took uh, Petersburg by storm in the 1840s. Part Gothic novel, part journalism, and part romance, Sue's novel describes how a disguised nobleman, Rodolphe, encounters the city's lower classes and chooses to live among them. He's accompanied by an assortment of socially conscious companions. However, the power of Sue's work relies not on its characters so much as its setting, which incorporates Gothic details into the Parisian cityscape. Sue sought to play upon his reader's emotions through his depiction of Paris's grimy underbelly. And indeed, he was so successful at this that his novel was credited with sparking the 1848 French Revolution. Additionally, Sue's novel directly inspired works like Nikolai Nekrasov's innovative edited volume, the Physiology, the Physiology of Petersburg, which was published in 1845. Physiological works of the mid to late 1840s used Sue's feuilletons as a model for the portrayal of day-to-day -day life in Petersburg. Sue's style, in turn, drew on low sensationalistic genres, including the Gothic, which encouraged a more fraught descriptive narrative. While most physiological sketches do not have a plot per se, Sue infused sensational plot turns into a predominantly descriptive work, thus rendering it a compelling read. As literature became, and I should say that this novel um, the Mysteries of Paris is about like over a thousand pages. So it's important that it's a page turner. Becoming a bestseller when you're that, that weighty is um, impressive. Um, as literature became increasingly linked to movements for social awareness and reform, writers began to experiment using Sue's newly reconceived physiological version of the feuilleton in Mysteries of Paris to describe lower class life in St. Petersburg. A physiological writer would in great detail note what his narrator perceived, for example, as he descended into a slum courtyard or a squalid tenement. Liberal use of sensational language was necessary in these instances to create an impression of horror for the reader. Earlier Petersburg texts created a cityscape populated by fantastic creatures, the devil strolling along the capital's boulevards, a monument coming to life and chasing a terrified clerk, a missing nose running amok amongst the famous landmarks, and even the ghost of a mild-mannered copyist sneaking up behind citizens and pulling their overcoats over their heads. In addition to these extraordinary characters, however, these earlier works associated a certain mood with the city. Anxiety, nervous and frenetic behavior, violence, want, and oppression were its main characteristics. As I argue, this atmosphere persists in the physiology of Petersburg, in descriptions of citizens and depictions of space. 
In particular, the melancholy and quote-unquote tomb-like claustrophobia come to the fore again and again. Furthermore, the blurring of the melodramatic and the mundane of the animate and the inanimate of the vulgar and sublime are established Gothic tricks that are employed liberally in Nekrasov's volume. So I'm going to talk about a couple of sketches from Nekrasov's volume. Um, the entire volume has been translated by Thomas Guyton Marullo, and I am, all the quotes that I'm reading are from uh, his translation. This is, uh, my slides are a bit mistaken. Um, so these are the two people that I'm talking about. So Nekrasov, the editor of the edited volume, and then um, Dmitry Grigorovich, who is the author of the first thing I'm talking about, and then Yevgeny Hrabenka, um, Grabenka, when he was published in Russian, uh, who is a Ukrainian writer who also um, contributed to the volume. Yeah. So in Petersburg Organ Grinders, author Dmitry Grigorovich concludes his pseudo-ethnographic essay on the customs of various Petersburg organ grinders with an affecting scene, um, which we see here on the slide. A man, overcome with melancholy because of the grim Petersburg weather, hears an organ grinder's music and feels momentarily cheered up. This scene relies on a specifically Gothic tone to describe the narrator's state of mind and its relationship to the city to, the, to project this experience onto the reader. The vulgar songs of a street organ inspired the narrator's emotional shift to the sublime. Inanimate objects appear and disappear or become other things altogether in this landscape. Not only is Gothic narrative at work here in descriptions that incorporate mournful sounds, violent action, and mysterious objects, it also figures prominently in the narrator's haunting. Like the technique of second-person narration, the Gothic appears in this episode to give the reader a more personal understanding of the experience of cheerfulness in the face of abject poverty and grim daily life. So moving on to the next one. Um, Ukrainian writer Yevgeny Hrabenka's vibrant Petersburg Quarter uses the same Gothic mode more overtly than other sketches. This sketch celebrates the various lives that make up the city's Petersburg Quarter region. While discussing theaters and other entertainments in the area, Hrabenka breaks the work's cheerful overall tone to observe an abandoned wooden arcade described as ruins, a particularly Gothic image. And that's the quote from the slide. This strange interlude emerges, be emerges between a lengthy description of theater history in the Petersburg Quarter and a discussion of the neighborhood's carriages and cabs. Um, so it does come across very suddenly and strangely in the, in the sketch. The memento mori suggests a bleak outlook for the little girl's future, as does the evocative image of the dog barking under the floorboards, which is reminiscent of Edgar Allan Poe's Telltale Heart, uh, which was published in 1843. Here again, just as elsewhere in the volume, the Gothic exposes the sad state of life among the lower classes for the sympathetic reader. The physiology of Petersburg marked a turning point in Russian literature and stood as a manifesto of sorts for the burgeoning early realist movement. Writers borrowed the depiction techniques used here from French physiological models, but fine-tuned them to meet the sociocultural specificities of the Russian capital. Following Sue's example, the writers who worked together on the physiology of Petersburg incorporated Gothic elements into their texts to establish atmosphere, engage the reader in the narrative, and communicate the urban poor's plight. Their work stands as testimony to early realist innovation. And I should say that for the talk, I have cut this drastically, but almost every text in this collection, and there were, um, I think, 15 or 20 texts in it, do contain these Gothic elements. Um, and now we're going to move on to Dostoevsky. Um, so Dostoevsky's early works present an intriguing contrast when read with reference to the physiology of Petersburg. His writing of the 1840s cannot be called physiological, but his inspiration draws on the same models used by the volume writers, including earlier physiological sketches and Sue's popular novel. However, Dostoevsky's work conflate the journalistic feuilleton with both Gogol's Hoffman-esque and George Sand's more tempered, socially conscious romantic tendencies. Gothic fiction, which if we recall Dostoevsky had experienced since childhood, also served as a major influence. Those Dostoevsky works set in Petersburg from this period create a cityscape at times fantastic and at times realistic that underscores the psychological state of his protagonists. An examination of Dostoevsky's text set in Petersburg from 1845 to 1849 reveals the interplay between the concept of a city as an ideological symbol and a fantastic dreamscape. Um, and here, I should say, the book chapter that this talk is taken from does look at all of the texts that are on the screen. Um, 
Um, but I'm only going to talk about two today, the first and the last. So I'll talk about poor folk and I'll talk about Nietzsche's Kanisvanova. Um, but the rest of them exist in the book chapter, if you're curious. Poor folk, Dostoevsky's earliest novel, is set in the Petersburg slums and depicts daily existence in language that implies mysteries and horrors. The most overtly Gothic scene maps to a rural landscape, not an urban one. Varvara writes to Dievushkin on September 3rd, describing her daydream. Um, and this is David Macduff's translation. Varvara's daydream here emphasizes both the experience of terror and the pleasure that can come from fear in retrospect when one feels safe. In Dostoevsky St. Petersburg, however, safe havens are altogether absent. The city's Gothic descriptions in poor folk are subtle, but serve to create a disturbing subtext of fear and anxiety. Cramped rooms are compared to coffins. Garashkov, Dievushkin's neighbor, lives with his family in an overcrowded room, and the sound of weeping comes from behind his door. Um, degradation and deprivation seem quite literally to be killing his family, beginning with his young son and then moving on to Garshkov himself. The anxiety Dievushkin feels as he walks along, as well as his fear of public life, sketch for the reader a cityscape characterized by facades that hide secrets and horrors. The epigraph of Poor Folk, which is taken from a Gothic tale by Vladimir Adovsky called A Living Corpse, from 1844, um, suggests that one of Dostoevsky's underlying premises was that the city's poor were trapped by both circumstance and the city itself. As Dostoevsky's brand of the Petersburg text evolves through, through this early period, his later depictions of the city absorb and build on his early text, earlier textual cityscapes. Accordingly, in Nietzschka Nizvanova from 1849, this is um, Dostoevsky's unfinished last work from this period, uh, the heroine's early life story contains all the previous elements of a Gothic Petersburg text. Nietzschka grows up in a labyrinthine tenement, trapped in a life of poverty as she witnesses her mother's abuse and exploitation at the hands of her stepfather, a drunk and failed musician with hints of madness about him. This fragmentary novel relies heavily upon the Petersburg setting to convey Nietzschka's emotional experiences. Um, as Nietzschka falls into a deep obsession with her stepfather, she projects her feelings onto descriptions of a house that she associates with him. Um, and this description of the house is from Jane Kentish's translation. Returning home, Nietzschka sees her stepfather waiting outside this residence. After this incident, she becomes fixated on the house. Um, when her stepfather tells her that he will be born again upon her mother's death, she begins to draw associations between her mother's death, her stepfather's rise in fortunes, and her own move into this specific house. The house has curtained windows with a blood-colored glow that represents her idol, but also has a darker side which is tied to her mother's death. Um, and the next image I'm going to show you is from a, um, I believe it's Ilya Glazunov, but I might be mistaken about the artist. Uh, but this is an illustration of Nietzschka Nizvanova, the scene I'm about to talk to, talk about. Um, as the fragment progresses, Nietzschka begins to differentiate between her internal and her external lives. Her internal life provides an escape for her in the first part of the fragment, allowing her to transcend the drudgery and poverty that characterize life with her mother and stepfather. When the tension within the apartment becomes overwhelming and she needs physical escape, she retreats to liminal spaces, her apartment's corner, her tenement stairwell, her building courtyard. Like so many other apartment buildings in Dostoevsky's works from this period, Nietzschka's tenement in resembles a dark castle in a Gothic novel. It harbors places like the stairwell, an exploratory space from which Nietzschka overhears truths, as well as the apartment itself, a chamber characterized by hidden horrors, such as, at first, the disintegration of her parents' relationship, and then, as we see in this, um, as well, you can't really see it in this image if you're in the room, uh, but those are the mother's feet there, and this is Nietzschka looking very terrified, um, and then her mother's stiffening corpse. Her mother's death destroys Nietzschka's idol and signals the beginning of the girl's isolated life with her stepfather. The nightmare she describes having while her mother lays dying becomes real, projected onto the city streets. Initially walking through the city at night under a light snowfall with her stepfather, Nietzschka feels happy that their dream is coming true. But when she switches her focus to the cityscape, ice-covered canals, the dark looming houses, and the isolation of city streets at night, and it is only then that she realizes that her stepfather is now about to abandon her. The scene quickly turns into a nightmare tableau. Nietzschka chases her stepfather, who's always out of reach, down St. Petersburg alleys, completely terrified and very afraid of returning to her mother's corpse in the apartment, but equally afraid of being left without any guardian or protector. Her frantic chase ends without resolution. 
Intriguingly, Nietzschka comes to associate all the important moments of her early life with features of the city. First, as she grows to love her stepfather, she associates him with the house with red curtains. Then as her stepfather's life spins out of control, she hides fearful on her tenement stairs waiting for him. The dark tenement staircase, with its shadows and hidden spaces, seems to reflect her fear. Finally, when her life changes following her mother's death, the transition occurs against the city backdrop. The fragment lacks the detailed descriptions of St. Petersburg that other texts set in the city during this period incorporate, but the cityscape nonetheless comes to characterize Nietzschka's earlier life. Nietzschka's early life revolves around three key Gothic moments, her fatal obsession with the red-curtained house, the hidden secrets of her tenement building, and the chase through the streets of St. Petersburg. These three scenes all contribute to a depiction of life among lower classes in St. Petersburg that is fraught with fear and anxiety, and that creates this emotional attachment that the uh, emotional attachment with the reader that the um, that the earlier physiological sketches also were trying to do. By the late 1840s, generic Gothic markers and cues that evoke claustrophobia and terror for readers were already incorporated into the meta narrative of the Petersburg text. The Gothic had grown so familiar in early realism that the mere mention of a dark and cramped tenement staircase or an icy canal sufficiently conjured readers' expectations. This Gothic dwelling on psychological states caused by anxiety or dread evokes the earlier romantic fantastic Petersburg texts of Pushkin and Gogol, while providing a frame for more physiological depictions. By framing their texts thus, Petersburg writers of this transitional period emphasize anxiety, fear, and dread without using the uncanny methods of Pushkin and Gogol, staying true to the new realist mode of writing, which eschewed the fantastic. As we can see, uh, and we can see the progression of this in Dostoevsky's later novels set in St. Petersburg. For example, when Raskolnikov's room is described as a coffin, or Svidrigailov is watching Raskolnikov and Sonia through the wall in Crime and Punishment, or when, in The Idiot, Rogozhin waits for Mushkin on a dark flight of stairs with his knife drawn. As a tool used to describe city interiors and exteriors, the Gothic mode enhanced the realist agenda by using pathos to appeal to readers' consciousness. The genre's immediate associations with transgression and moral wrong made it an ideal backdrop to influence the dramatic scenes unfolding on its Petersburg canvas. For writers depicting Petersburg, the Gothic's use was twofold. Its signifiers underscored social injustice and moral wrongs, but as a mode of writing, it also allowed romantic depictions of Petersburg to carry over into realist texts. In accommodating the hyperbolic language and extreme moods of the Gothic in their writing, these authors changed the basic setting and array of conventions, effectively translating the genre not only deeper into the Russian literary language, but more importantly, into the realist project. In appropriating the genre for this purpose, the early realist writers evoke the sense of the Gothic, its psychologies, its modes and themes, without relying upon its trappings, its settings, character types, or master plots. Instead, they use their own setting, the Russian capital of St. Petersburg. This newly exposed, gritty Gothic Petersburg signified an important shift in Russian literary history and set the stage for the discussions of social change to come. As my book reveals, Gothic realism was widespread in 19th century Russian works, and the Gothic played a significant role in Russian literature's development. Indeed, as I demonstrate, during the foundational years of literary realism, Gothic elements within the realist narrative fabric were broadly deployed. Authors from the 1840s through the early 20th century and beyond incorporated Gothic devices, themes, tropes, and even master plots into their works. Examining Gothic realism shows how the Gothic functions within realist narrative as a model for depicting elements that do not mesh easily with everyday experience within the bounds of realism, specifically uh, those affective elements. Realist writers use the Gothic to highlight a specific transgression, trauma, or injustice, or to engage readers on a deeply effective level through building up fear. The genre's power lies in the implicit relationship forged between writer, reader, and text, a relationship predicated on expectation and familiarity of the genre. In this sense, realist writers use Gothic narrative devices, tropes, and themes to harness this relationship of expectation and familiarity. These writers' engagement with the Gothic is thus not just a colorful way to describe the gloomy and macabre, but a deliberate appropriation of a system of reader expectation and generic convention. Thank you.